Hello, and you're very welcome to another edition of The Week That Really Was with John McGurk and Sarah Ryan for this week, ending the 29th of March, or if you're religious, ending with Easter Sunday. Um, Sarah, how have you been? I've been good. Yeah, it's been a fun week to watch politics. Well, I've been taking a break. I haven't been watching politics. I have been in the lovely former imperial city of Budapest, uh, which is the capital of Hungary. Um, and uh, just, uh, just literally for no work reason, just um, the, herself and myself decided we take a, an Easter break. And it's a place we both want to go and have never been. And I'll tell you, it's very beautiful. It's a lot like a lot of these other Eastern European or, or Central European cities like Vienna or Prague or, or one of those places. But once again, I have to say, just going to uh, another European capital. Like every time I every time I do this, I, I I kind of come home feeling ashamed of the state of Dublin, and then I kind of forget for a while, and then I go somewhere else, and once again it's just hammered home to me like uh, how how different the feel is in so many other European cities. And do they not have a tent city a hundred few hundred meters away from their government building? They don't, um, but they also, I think the biggest single difference between Dublin and the rest of Europe, and not necessarily the rest of Europe, because I'm sure there's somebody somewhere someplace that's as bad as Dublin. But the biggest difference I, I find is that the, the the level of visible policing. This is another city where you where, where anywhere you go, basically there's no street in which you don't see there are a police car or a policeman, and not in a threatening way, not like lads holding AK forty sevens on the street corner. Just visible policing. It's really clean. Um, my wife was saying to me that, you know, it's the kind of place where you can sit outside, you can have a cup of coffee and put your phone and your wallet on the table in front of you and not be afraid of somebody coming past on a bicycle and, and robbing them. Um, like, the, the, the doesn't seem to be much crime. Everything is pristinely clean. The atmosphere is really nice. I don't know if you read, a, Mary Louise O'Donnell published a piece on Gripped earlier on this week about a night out she had in Dublin and she was talking about just the noise of the sort of just generic abuse that you hear being shouted on O'Connell Street. Lads roaring at each other on street corners. None of that here. The atmosphere is so is so much different. Um, and it just, um, it, I, I, I sent a tweet earlier on in the week and I said, look, I, I think if you could move the entire population of Dublin to some other European city just for a week, and just have them experience it as a, en masse and then bring them home again, I'm not entirely sure there's a single Dublin city councillor who'd be re-elected. And probably the same goes for Cork, Galway and Limerick, to be honest. Yeah, like there's an element of the boiled frog to the whole of Dublin city centre from for me. I think slowly but surely it's gotten worse and worse. Um, and so the entire traffic system it's deliberately designed to, you know, make you not want to ever drive in there. But for, for some people, that's not an option. And especially if you're coming from the north side, you just it's just becoming, you know, an hour and a half of a complete ball ache to come from the north side of the city into city centre. Um, and then there's the whole the whole crime feeling about it. It doesn't feel safe. So I think slowly but surely it's really deteriorated. Yeah. And I mean, the, the other thing here is that like, it doesn't ever. It doesn't feel congested. They've got they've got trams like Dublin does. They've got an underground like Dublin doesn't. Um, but it it, it doesn't like it, it's a city. I think there's three or four times the size of Dublin. Yet it feels much less crowded um, as well. Um, which again is is, is something I I've, I've really noticed is, is that the sort of management of their public spaces is done so well. I just think um, you know the other thing that struck me was. Uh, Mary Louise, in her piece, which was published on, I think, Tuesday, said that one of her things was she said, look, we think people who come from outside of Dublin don't notice. That's one of the lies we tell ourselves. That's kind of the yeah. happy, happy-go-lucky Irish jolliness kind of overrides it. I don't think it does. And that was reinforced to me when I was checking into my hotel and the guy at reception spoke perfect English and was delighted to hear we were from Ireland and had actually spent two years in Dublin himself. And I said, oh, did you like it? And he said, not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> which is I don't know whether that's a Hungarian trait, but it was it was a, it was an instance of sort I said why and he said I just it, it, bad atmosphere. That's what he said. Um, so oh, I mean, people, people do notice it, uh, but that was that's the first time in my life I've ever said to somebody, "Did you like Ireland?" And they didn't out of politeness go, "Oh yeah, it was amazing." No, this guy was just like, "Not really." Um, but it was it, it was at once kind of insulting and refreshing. Um, mm-hmm. So. Anyway, so that's where I've been. Tell me what's been happening at home. Well, this has been a bit of a right wing coup while you've been gone, John. It seems. <laughs> um, well, if, if only I knew it was me that's been holding the right wing coup back for all these years. Oh yeah, years ago. Yeah. Um. So as you are aware, 
uh, Simon Harris, uh, the Dauphin of Fine Gael, um, has became the leader or is in the process, whatever way that works. But very quickly afterwards, I was um, driving on Sunday and uh, Michael Ring went on radio and did an interview, which I happened to catch because I was in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was actually swiftly followed by an interview with Ivana Batchik. So there was high highs and low lows from my point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, he talked about how Fine Gael had been too left for too long. He talked about how on the ground Fine Gael uh, TDs were getting, um, we need to bin the hate speech bill, we need to go back to Fine Gael values, we need to go stop, uh, you know, basically taking our advice from NGOs on who Fine Gael is and get back to who we are and whatever. And like, obviously, I'm not, Fina Gaylor, but I mean, hook it to my veins, honestly. I was like, this guy's amazing. I'm loving this. Um, and then I thought, then there was a, a, a Barry Cowan uh, was on to- uh, and Neil Richmond were on talking about how the, the hate speech bill was going to be revised. And now the government seemed to be, um, well, you know, pulling back and saying, no, it, it, it is going ahead. But there was a couple of days there, John, where my, you know, I, I was definitely, my heart was fluttering at the idea that common sense had returned to these fair, fair, this fair island. But no, no, doesn't look like it. So. Um, I don't know. I, I Like I said, I haven't been paying attention and I haven't, I didn't hear Michael Ring's interview and I definitely didn't hear Ivana Bashik's interview and I haven't been paying attention to the minutiae of it. But I have been sort of like casting my gaze in that general direction. And it seems to me that the government are in this kind of odd position where, um, They have an incoming administration, the one led by Simon Harris, and they have an outgoing administration, the one led by Leo Varadkar. And kind of the outgoing administration is is still trying to mount a defense of the hate speech bill. Um, So they're still trying to say, look, this is why we need it and all the rest of it. While at the same time, it looks like, um, you know, the, the, the parrot from Monty Python. (laughs) <laughs> it it is expired. It has ceased to be. It is it is no longer in this mortal plane. Um, I saw Sinn Fein uh, obviously have changed their position. We can talk about more about that in a, in, in a few minutes. But more than that, I mean, the the enthus- there's the, the the defenses for it all seem to me to be to the extent that I've seen any of them in the past tense. More, uh, this is why we brought it forward. This is what it sought to achieve. This is why we needed it. As opposed to as opposed to any real conviction that this is going to happen in the next three months, that they're actually going to spend significant amounts of legislative time trying to ram this shit sandwich down the throats of the electorate. I I just don't see it. I I, I think it's, and I think that they're in an awkward position, Fine Gael, but the government in, in as a whole, in that they cannot pronounce it dead because to do so would, would probably cause a, a shitstorm on their left flank with the aforementioned NGOs and probably a bunch of green TDs and all the rest of it. So they have to kind of defend this piece, dead piece of legislation while walking it slowly towards the grave. That's that's how I, that's how, that's how what I perceive to be happening. Uh, do you think I'm wrong? Or do you think there's real conviction behind the sort of... No, no, don't be ridiculous. Um, no conviction behind any of this, but no... Uh, I, I just don't understand. I mean, I, I feel like Simon Harris had the perfect opportunity to just shelve this, make it look like something different was about to happen. And, um, you know, like he could have done this in a couple of small moves and he would have really changed things, I feel, even if only temporarily for Fine Gael. And continuing with this nonsense is just sending the strongest message possible that it's more of the same. Um, like I'm not, ex- I'm not saying I expect the Simon Harris to set the world on fire by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm kind of stunned that he's using this as, you know, like that he's allowing this to become a stickler right out of the right out of the bat, right off the bat for his leadership. Well, there's uh, no clear, there's no clear direction, is there? That's the funny thing. You say leadership, but there's no clear direction. So you've got Michael Ring on one radio show saying uh, it's dead, uh, Fiddy Ailman too left for too long. Basically, you know, uh, you, you, I don't know if you've started working for Michael Ring or you're writing the scripts, but sounding like you. <laughs> um, and then on the other hand, you've got you've got my old friend, uh, Senator Barry Ward, on the radio, apparently, it, you were saying before we went there, morning, noon and night, defending the thing. And, and it strikes me that this is a perfect opportunity for the incoming Taoiseach to actually give a clear direction on what's happening to his own party, let alone the rest of us. No? Yeah, but it also wouldn't have, like, I, I don't think it would have cost him much. I mean, I don't think, like like I said, like, Neil Richmond came out and said, 
that it wasn't gone, then it was, and it wasn't. Do you know what I mean? Like they didn't seem to kind of half know themselves. And then it, I feel like it ver- it comes across very much that the Fine Gael TDs would prefer to just not have to talk about the hate speech bill anymore. And this seemed like the opportunity to get rid of it. And instead he's going to batten down. And, and I mean, this is a guy who, you know, I think, and like, this isn't necessarily a criticism, but has been quite Machiavellian in, in becoming leader and has obviously been planning for it for quite some time. And to come out and kind of, you know, make a couple of speeches and like meet the media and like, honest to God, like I nearly, I, I just, I said before on the podcast, like I really hate kind of politicians trying to be cool, you know, that kind of thing. And when he was like, if you think there's no life in Vina Gale, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. I thought I was going to punch myself in the face just to make the cringe go away. Well, it was very funny because he, he basically, if you listen to what he said, he said, if you think Vina Gale is dead, you ain't seen nothing yet. Which was like, you know, watch me Actually, kill it. A double, a double negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what I thought was 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 interesting. I watched a little bit of his, his uh, speech. Um, at the selection convention, although it was a strange selection convention because there were only two candidates for two positions. So it was more like a Fine Gael rally in Athlone over the weekend. And um, so I watched a little bit of his of his big speech, which I think was on Saturday. Um, and it struck me that it was it was it was ex- as it was exceptionally empty on policy. Yes. It was sort of like we like farmers, we don't like Sinn Fein tone to it, and he got this huge cheer from like the aff- assembled blue shirt faithful by uh, mentioning the national flag being tra- draped over the the coffin of Pierce Macaulay at his uh, Republican funeral in the North uh, last week. Um, and I thought to myself, yeah, that's you know, if you can't get a cheer at Fine Gael conference for bashing the Shinners about using the tricolor wrong, uh, you, you may as well quit. So, so there's no need for him to quit, but but that's not going to win Fine Gael back a load of votes. I mean, the, no. the people, people who people who are receptive to the idea that we shouldn't elect Sinn Féin because of the um, its history are not in the Fine Gael column, or sorry, are not in the Sinn Féin column as it stands. Um, and I'm not entirely sure there's a load of them floating around who are voting independent who are going to go, well, I'm, I'm going to have I'm going to vote for Simon Harris now because he doesn't like the Shinners and I don't like the Shinners. The, there was the, and that was really it. It was very empty, and and it strikes me as such a wasted opportunity. He will never be more powerful unless he wins the next election. Then he'll be really powerful the day after the election. But between now and the election, he will never be more politically powerful than he is now, because yeah. he's he's got a clean slate. He's he can he he has been in the backwater ministry for the last two or three years, um, doing his penance for whatever he did to piss off Leo Varadkar, um, and. And uh, class in the government the last time, that's right. And he has he, he has a plausible claim to say that none of the current stink is really attached to him. So if ever there was a time to, to, ter- to clearly shift direction, in whatever direction that may be, not necessarily in your direction or my direction, but any clear shift in direction, this is the best time to do it. But that's and, but that's my point, John. Is that okay? It, it happens. A, a lot of what Michael Ring was saying on the radio happens to be my direction. Fine. But I also think that it's the direction of a lot of the public. And specifically, I think it's the direction of a lot of Fine Gael voters who don't who do, aren't voting Fine Gael at the moment. And mm. um, I think that there's a if I, you know, I mean, you, like you're knocking around politics as long as I am. So, you know, the way in your mind's eye, when you close your eyes and you imagine the, the classic kind of Fine Gael voter, you have a picture in your mind of who they are. The same with Fianna Fáil, the same, same with Sinn Féin, etc. So that classic guy who a man who is of a certain age who votes for Fine Gael, he's listening. He, I think, my political nose tells me that he's listening to Michael Ring and going, yeah, that's what I want back. He's not listening to, he doesn't care. He knows Fine Gael are going to give out about Sinn Féin. He's never going to vote Sinn Féin. But he's looking around outside of Fine Gael because of things like crime, because of things like immigration, because of things like education, because of things like health, because of those kind of things. And is the speech shouting and roaring and waving your hand around like a lunatic because of Sinn Féin and the tricolor? Uh, like you're 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 preaching to your own people there, and they're all going to whoop. And you know that's as old as time. That happens in Fianna Fáil as well. If you ever want a big a big cheer, you just say something bad about Sinn Féin. Grant, but it's it, it, it it's it's worse than just like not you know not saying or not talking about deep policy things in your speech 
It's worse because it's also a clear demonstration that whatever bubble has happened in Leinster House for the last two or three years hasn't popped. And he's still in it. No, it hasn't. And I think the problem with Fine Gael is that it, what, what Fine Gael no longer realises is that it is not just one political party, but two. So there are two Fine Gaels. There is the guy you're talking about, um, the sort of, and, and you say when I think of a, an archetypal Fine Gael, or I think of, I think of lots of them I knew growing up with in sort of rural county Monaghan. They're, they're, in my mind, they're always those men who still wear kind of suit, a tie, a shirt and tie, even when they're retired. I yes. <laughs> uh, or or they're or they're they're farmers or businessmen in sort of rural Ireland, um, or indeed they're business women or female yeah. farmers. There's a there's a Ireland. picture like it's like Mairead McGuinness. There's a picture of Fine Gaelor that I can see. But the problem is, there's another kind of Fine Gaelor that we don't talk about, and that kind of Fine Gaelor also wears a suit. But instead of working on a farm in County Mayo, they work in uh, Al Goodbody's offices in Dublin, yeah. um, and they they really like. They're the kind of people I described them during the week. Uh, Fine Gael calls itself progressive centrist, which means basically we agree with um, uh, Fint O'Toole and Una Mullally on absolutely everything except taxes on the rich and maybe maybe a European common defence. These are people who work in sort of law firms in Dublin, accountancy firms. They're, they're, they they go to Ireland rugby matches. Um, they 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 really care about things like. Um, being seen as tolerant and liberal and progressive on social issues, even though they live really conservative lives themselves with a wife and two kids, um, and but they also care about sort of low taxes and and cracking down on what the rest of us would call crime and they might call scumbags on the street. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, the problem is Fine Gael, uh, you know, believes it represents that second Fine Gaeler. It be- that's what it believes itself to be. It believes itself to be a party for the sort of well-to-do upper middle urban Irish people. That's what it believes itself to be. The problem is that there aren't that many of those people. There just are, happen to be an awful lot of them in sort of central Dublin where all the politicians are. They, they, that's where they're concentrated. Whereas the actual Fine Gaelor out in sort of, you know, Salins, who lives a little bit outside the town and, you know, suddenly seeing services go away, seeing immigration issues in his town, seeing law and order, having to deal with rampant burglaries in the local area, all that sort of stuff. That person is very alienated. The sort of traditional backbone of Ireland, middle class person, they're very alienated. That's what I think, if that's not too much waffle. But I, I really do think they have an identity crisis um, in that they are the party of the partner in AL Goodbody and they're no longer the party of the guy standing at a mart in Granard. Yeah, well, Michael Ring wants them to be. He does, and he's right. Because the, the guy standing at the mart in Granard, well, not necessarily Granard, but somewhere like Granard, is the Michael Ring voter. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the guy in AL Goodbody is not, but they may be the Simon Harris voter. Uh, but anyway, I, I look, we could talk about this all day long, but Fine Gael has an identity crisis, and, and I think that identity crisis is encapsulated. I mean, we talk about those two Fine Gaels. The guy who's out campaigning for the hate speech bill on Radio All Week is Barry Ward, barrister at law, senator representing um, the county of Dunleary and Rathdown. And Michael Ring um, is very much not a barrister, uh, very much a Mayo man and out there saying we've been too left for too long. It's not one party anymore. It's two, and they have yet to reconcile the fact that they're losing one of them. That's what I think. But it's interesting, you just said there as well, because um, you're moving on a bit on this to Fianna Fáil a bit. Like, you and I are in a couple of WhatsApp groups with um, Fianna Gael people, um, or Fianna Gael-minded people, we'll say. And um, over the last few, couple of years, or three years, say, in this coalition period, I've there's been different phases where I have thought that Fianna Gael were coming out on top in the co- in the coalition relationship or at other times Fianna Fáil was. And open, uh, recently enough, I thought that it had kind of shifted a bit and that Fianna Fáil, all things considered, were actually coming out on top a bit because of the, you know, the criticisms of certain portfolios and, you know, just events, you know, whatever. But I thought that the Leo leaving and the potential for a change in the sh- in the in the kind of direction or the 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 things that Fine Gael were talking about and like binning the hate speech bill and a couple of other things was actually going to be quite poor for the fortunes of Fianna Fáil. 
um, because I think that they would, you know, Fine Gael would start to come out on top again. Um, but all things considered, I actually think Simon Harris might end up being quite good news for Fianna Fáil, um, apart from Do the fact, apart from the fact that Fianna Fáilers have to go in and vote for a man who they uh, voted no confidence in before and said that he wasn't capable of being a minister and now they have to vote for him to be leader. And I know that people will say in the comments, well, that's what you do or whatever, but it's not what you do. It's not because we don't normally have three Taoiseach teaching in a, a term like this. We've now, we don't have a rotating Taoiseach like this. And um, we don't, I know that in the past people will say that, you know, um, Charlie Holly was voted in, blah, blah, blah. But realistically speaking, Simon Harris, due respect to him, has never really had a real job outside of politics. He didn't do a good job with some of his previous portfolios and Fianna Fáil were very vocal about that. And no matter what way you dice and slice it, it's more tough for you to go in and vote for him as Taoiseach. Well, you see, I, if you're saying that Fianna Fáil will come out badly of this, I agree. I, I thought we were I thought we were, were sort of, I thought you were going in a different direction, but you're correct. They will. But I, I'd add two more reasons for that. Reason number one, is that when I was saying Fine Gael are two parties and there's there's that sort of affluent liberal element to Fine Gael, and you see it in all the votes, you see it in the referendum votes, for example. Fine Gael voters were actually 50-50 on the referendums and almost every other party was against it, uh, outside the sort of social democrats. Um, you see it in immigration. Fine Gael voters are actually pretty evenly split on immigration with the public 75% against it. Like, Fine Gael actually does have and has always had that sort of liberal, progressive, well-to-do, Don Leary, Rathdown, wing to it. Uh, Fianna Fáil has never necessarily had that, or at least not to any kind of degree. So they're more damaged by the by policies that appeal to that crowd. That's, that's issue number one. Mm-hmm. Issue number two, though, is the age gap. Nobody's talking about the age gap. Not only is Micheál Martin going to elect Simon Harris as Taoiseach, having uh, basically said he's incompetent um, on a number of occasions, he's then going to have to defend all the policies of the government and, and and basically look whipped. He's going to stand beside this young whippersnapper. If the public were to get an impression in three or four months that Simon Harris is not up to much, and you got Michal Martin standing there beside him, uh, having said he's incompetent, and now standing there, it, it, the, the contrast is going to be very... It's going to make Michal Martin look sort of weak, uh, to the extent that he doesn't look weak already. I've always thought he looks like a... a, a I've always thought... You know, Fianna Fáilers never agree with me on this, but I've always thought Bing Hall Martin does not project strength. He projects a kind of wateriness. Um, and I think I think the contrast with Harris, especially if Harris ends up not being um, flavour of the month with the electorate, and that remains to be seen. I think oh, that, I will, mean, that will look that will look bad. There's definitely optics there. It's kind of like, you know, like the guy who you know, arrives at the barbecue with a girlfriend. He's just so delighted to have a girlfriend that even though she treats him like crap and makes him look like an idiot the whole time, he's just so goddamn happy to have a girlfriend that he doesn't care. Yes. There's an element of that to it, for sure. But do you not think that potentially, because, like, I agree with some of the stuff you just said there about Michal, but, like, don't under, like, I wouldn't underestimate Michal's ability to turn something, to turn, you know, to to turn something in favour of Michal. And do you not think that if Simon Harris starts to flounder in a couple of months, that Michal will look like the, you know, strong dad who just like helps him, makes him look more competent by comparison because he's got that maturity and that experience? I don't know. I mean, I think I think I, it remains to be seen and we're, we can't predict the future. But I think the problem is going to be that if you're a voter and you approve of what the government is doing, um, and you've got this young lad leading us, striding the country into the future. Let's uh, let's imagine for a moment that we're convinced sort of government supporters. Then I think the credit for that will naturally flow towards the young guy who's just made the, the you know, breathe new life into the coalition. And if you're on the other hand, you're somebody who who really doesn't like the direction of of, of the government. Then what's the point of Fianna Fáil? I mean, in either case, in either case, Fianna Fáil is kind of reduced to a kind of bit part player in the narrative of Irish politics for the next 12 months. The next 12 months is going to be the Simon Harris show, one way or the other. With Micheál Martin like you know, auditioning for a role of supporting actor. 
uh, which is a bad place to be in going into an election, especially when they've come from this kind of arrangement where it was Varadkar and Martin. And we elected them both at the last election. They were both sort of got a co-equal mandate. You know, Varad- whatever happens, Michal Martin will look like old news compared to Simon Harris. That's what I think is going to happen. Um, well, I suppose we'll have to wait and see, but um, I, I, I think that voting for Harris in the beginning is not sitting well with a lot of Fianna Fáil TDs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God, come on. I mean, just don't, don't, I, mean I, I know you're not their spokesperson, but like, <laughs> don't give me that. Well, he's not sitting well with us as we, we troop through the lobbies and we do it anyway. We want to know that we're doing this thing that we don't think is good for our party or our country with the utmost reluctance. G- g- grow a pair. Grow oh, a I, pair. I, I, I mean, like, I mean, I, that's, why, why do you think I'm on this podcast? Like, do you know what I mean? Because I'm fed up with the inability of the Fianna Fáil part, part, part of entry party to grow a pair or even half a pair on anything, to be honest. Uh, for the last three or four years in particular, they, they, I mean, it's like a half dead lemming. So, mm-hmm. yeah, fine. But, I mean, I think that, the, you know, even if you've been bitch slapped around elector- politically for the last four years, you're still capable of being humiliated. And I think this is just another one. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I just... And I have had, as I said, the benefit of sort of looking at it from a distance this week. And from a distance, you know, when you're there, uh, you're at home and you're sort of following the news or in my case, writing about the news every single day of the week, you're kind of always wrapped up in the latest development, sort of, yeah. like, you know, what's happening today? Who said this on the radio? What, you know, whereas when you're when you're just kind of sort of checking in out of interest from afar, the thing that gets me just looking at it is the, the hopelessness with which they're searching around, and I mean the government as a whole, for an identity. Mm. There, there, there is no identity there. And the hate speech bill, like, I, I just find it fascinating that there's been so much talk about it this week. I really find it fascinating because, I mean, in, in one sense, if you take a step back, why has there been so much talk about it? This thing has been been dead for nine months. It hasn't seen the inside of a parliamentary chamber since it got you know, withdrawn from the Shannon quietly to go away for unspecified amendments, the, the details of which have never been discussed or revealed. Um, you know, obviously there's been, because it was never fully withdrawn, there have been some people who have been running this low-lying campaign against it in the background and so on. But the government has no really good reason to be talking about it at all. I mean, it's, 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 it's out there in the open as sort of a symbol of the identity crisis that's going on uh, in the Oireachtas at the moment, because it's it's uh, and I think it's a proxy for a lot of things. If you look at uh, immigration, but well, they can't really talk about immigration because they don't know what to do about it. Um, they they can't really talk about law and order because they don't know what to do about it. They can't really talk about um, much of anything really because they, they they don't really have a direction where to go. The hate speech bill is the only thing they can talk about because there is a decision to be made one way or the other there whether they formally put it out of its misery or whether they try and resuscitate the poor thing. I mean, at this stage, pull the plug and, and sell the organs or donate the organs to some other piece of legislation. I don't know. But that, I think I think it's a symbol of the identity crisis where they're, they're desperately casting around to try and figure out who we are. It's like watching, uh, you know, somebody on a shrink's couch watching Irish politics from afar at the moment. That, that's what it's like, I think. Um, and 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 that that's the core thing. Fine Gael have just taken this momentous step. They've elected the youngest leader in their history, the man who will be our youngest teacher, t- teacher ever, um, somebody who they think has immense political talent, but not one of them has a clue what direction they're actually going to take the country in or what direction they as a party want to take the country in, um, beyond sort of muddling through and hoping that, you know, the power of charisma itself will draw the, the young men and women, but mainly young women of the nation to Simon Harris's flag. Am I wrong? No, no, it sounds pretty spot on. Um, uh, what I think is, speaking of identity cri- crises, what I think is is helping them and and what's you know working well for them is that, and I don't remember this happening, um, quite so much in in any government that I re- remember, is that their main opposition party is having a massive identity crisis of their own. Um, I mean, I, I, I. I I've said before on the podcast that I'm I am reluctant to be overly critical of people who change their mind on things. But I think Sinn Fein are absolutely at sea at the moment and what they're doing. 
and coming out now and saying about the hate speech bill well like on the one hand yeah great i welcome that because that is in line with what i want from my opposition but they all voted for it and instead i i mean i think they missed a trick when they should have said you know we we did vote for this but on reflection you know we we made a mistake i think that would have been kind of passed over faster than what they're doing now which is this kind of roundabout mealy mouth kind of talking out both sides of their mouth about it um and i just think Sinn Féin have gone from being the uh, obvious big election winner um and in line with you know somewhat in line with the public mood on a number of key issues to being like a kind of an arm a wing of the government and <laughs> lower it's it's not just on the hate speech bill where they're at sea. I was struck. I, I I just couldn't help but be struck by the shinners on the whole. I mean, this was the week of two Republican funerals, right? So you had um, you had Pierce McCauley, the the man who was sentenced, I believe, for the manslaughter of Garda Jerry McCabe, um, and who served time in prison for that crime, and then was released from prison, and then was convicted of um, domestic abuse against his wife. Pauline Tully, who's a Sinn Féin TD, um, and who died and was buried in County Tyrone. And then you also had Rose Dugdale, who was a former, you know, um, what I think we you know, would have called Sloan Ranger from sort of the born from a very well-to-do family in central London, who became a sort of, you know, one of these sort of Constant Markievicz kind of posh revolutionary types who made bombs and everything for the IRA for 20 years. And she died. Um, and in one case, the, the Shinners completely boycotted the funeral. You know, Pierce McCauley's a terrible Republican. He's awful. Um, w- w- nobody would want to associate with him. You know, nothing to do with the Shin, not in the Sinn Féin family um, because of his horrible crimes against his wife. And on the other hand, Rose Dugdale, you know, absolute heroine of the revolution. We'd all be there um, with all our, you know, the, the old Sinn Féin grey hairs will be there to, uh, to, to carry her to her eternal reward, whatever that may be. Um, and it's just striking like, the, the the identity crisis there is that you know let's I, I, I'm going to take all morality out of it. I'm not going to comment on my own views on the morality of this one way or the other. But one IRA killer bad because he also abused one of our own. Another IRA killer an absolute heroine because she didn't touch one of our own. And you're trying to make this some kind of point of principle. It, it's just an identity crisis, and it 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 feels almost woke woke to me. It's it's like you. On one hand, the issue is uh, this person uh, blew up the Brits, um, so they're good. On the other hand, this person also blew up the Brits, but on the other hand, was also a domestic violence perpetrator, so we can't deal with him. I mean, what are you? What are you? Are you? Are you selectively Republican now? Are you? Are you against killing uh, or domestic abuse, but not blowing things up? I mean, it just struck me as kind of the worst kind of hypocrisy. Um, and and as as we say, an identity crisis. They don't really know how Republican they can even be anymore, or in what circumstances they can be unapologetically Republican. And then there's the hate speech bill. So, um, have you anything to add to what I said there, or we just go back to talking the hate speech bill? But I wanted to get that off my chest because well, I just I thought think, it was. Yeah, I think I think what it is is that as they started, and this is my theory, that as they started to increase in polling numbers and they started to become more, um let's just say palatable as a voting option for people that would not have considered Sinn Féin previously. They started to, you know, get kind of excited by this. They, they, they became more kind of mainstream, more respectable as an option. And then they started as uh, when the going started to get tough on a number of issues, they started panicking about how to keep their old vote that was always loyal to them, plus this new vote. And they're just making a hames of it every time. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, that's that's my theory. And I think that now they're in this position where they're completely on the back foot all the time. They're 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 there's no consistent message. It's it feels panicked all the time. And as I've said on the podcast before, like I'm not suggesting for a moment that Sinn Féin should bear somebody like me in mind in terms of how they, you know, address uh, address any issue or 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 um approach anything because I'm never going to vote for Sinn Féin in the month of Sundays. However, I do resent the fact that the main opposition party isn't offering opposition. And I think there are probably other people out there who might have given Sinn Féin a transfer or, you know, or vote or, or move towards voting for them just based on the fact that they were calling the government to account on a number of the issues that mattered to them. And they're not even doing that. 
So what's the point here? I mean, Mary used to be a good performer. You know, she was like, you know, you talk about people doing their job well. You know, you wouldn't. I don't think there was. I, 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 I know because I've spoken to them. But I think a lot of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael TDs would have not relished the idea of going up against her in a debate. She was and, phenomenal at the last election. We exactly. have to say that in the twenty twenty election, in particularly with the debates with Micheál Martin and Neil Bracker, she was the star of the show. She had an amazing election campaign. So, so you yeah. have to give her credit for that, um, yeah. objectively. But and so, you know, where's that person gone? And, and and where's the direction and who are the like there used to be it used to just feel like there was a kind of a there was a and and by the way i i i would say that the the same thing about the other the two main or all of the government parties actually there there felt like there was a cohesive team at the front of the party and it doesn't feel like that anymore yeah it's funny you say you're not the target audience for Sinn Féin and you don't think they should should try and appeal to you and, I, and i'm not either but I, i'll say this much there are a whole bunch of grip readers who are their target audience. There are a whole bunch of people who read Gripped every week, um, uh, who come to our events or who even donate or subscribe to us, who are so because they have a sort of alienation from the established order of the country. Like that's that's why they're reading us. They're looking. But they're for not the aliens. But they're not the party for the alienated people anymore. This this is my point. This is the point that I'm making. I mean, the, 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 there are a lot of people out there who feel deeply alienated and disaffected, and not just on the issues that you and I talk about, not just on sort of cultural issues, be it hate speech or, um, you know, uh, transgender stuff or, or, or free speech, um, but on, on sort of more fundamental issues like wait times and housing lists. You know, Im- immigration is a massive one for that constituency, and the polls show it as well. And Sinn Féin have nothing to offer their own voter base. Like mm-hmm. there was always a sense with Sinn Fein that they were going to, you know, when, when, you know, because, and, and this is, I, I would always say this to people who who listen to this podcast who believe possibly in the, you know, in really radical change. Radical change is never ever going to happen in our political system because it's not designed to facilitate it. You 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 get into power, you're going to have to make compromises. You're going to, your first day, your first meeting is going to be with the American Chamber of Commerce, who are going to say, you know, this is what we need to do to keep jobs in the country, and you're going to find your principles compromised on day one. That is going to happen no matter who you are. Um, so there was always a degree to which Sinn Fein, once they got into power, were going to have to come to terms with having made some promises that they were not going to be in a position to keep. But it's astonishing that they've gotten themselves into this mess before even entering government. Yeah. Like, that's an achievement in, its, in itself. I mean, they, they've gotten themselves into this mess where, like, you look at them now and, like, what what does Sinn Féin stand... I mean, the one thing you could say dis- where they still have a distinct identity is on the national, you know, United Ireland question. And I, honest to God, I mean, I know the polls will say there's like 65, 70% support for it, and I'm sure there is. But how much does the average voter really care about that? It's it's like, you know, if you ask me, who, who do I want to win between um, Arsenal and Brentford at the weekend? I'd say Brentford, but I don't really care. You know what I mean? It's not it's not an animating an animating passion, but I'd have an answer for it. And I I I just I just don't think they are connecting with people on any sort of emotional level anymore. At the last election, Mary Lou Macdonald connected with people at an emotional gut level, where she said, "Look, I'm standing here between these two bozos." one of whom is responsible for running the country into the ground and the other one who supported him while he did it and didn't even provide opposition. We're here, we're a real opposition, we're a real alternative. And she connected with people at an emotional level. Um, Sinn Féin has, has either forgotten how to do that or did it by accident the last time or something or other. But I agree with you, they're, they're, in, a, they're, they're in a horror show. And I don't think the slide in their vote um, has stopped yet. Like I would not be surprised if they ended up having a, a cripplingly disappointing local and European elections where they're on twenty five percent in the polls going into it, and emerge with something like nineteen or seventeen percent. Gosh, and uh, uh, the, uh, to the benefit of whom? To the benefit of sort of assorted assorted independents and loudmouths. And I don't I don't say loudmouths I don't say loudmouths in a disparaging way. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I say it in the way of people who will grab the public's attention. Uh, elections are ultimately about about you know who grabs your attention who speaks for you right that's you, you cast your vote people always it, it, there's always this pretense when you do civics in schools that voting is a sign of a, a rational activity where you you carefully consider all the party manifestos and you say oh well, that person's going to introduce you know child care credit and and I've got children so I'm going to vote for that that's not some people yes but 
in the, by and large, it is an emotional gut level check. That's why the TV debates are so important. They're so important because you, you identify with a person and say, yeah, I feel like that's the person for me and you go and vote for them. And I just don't think people are looking at Sinn Féin at the moment and going, yeah, th- those are the people for me. I, 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 it's, it's not happening in the way it did at the last election, which is what propelled them. I also think that I've always <clears throat> felt that there's also on the reverse side of that a huge amount of um, over um, kind of congratulation of people behind the scenes, whether it's Sinn Féin or Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael, when they did have a good election, as if there was some kind of like, you know, deep strategic movement. I mean, I think that like strategists and people who work in politics tinker around the edges. But if there's a wave against the government, like, you know, case in point, people in Sinn Féin last time got elected while they were on holidays. Like, you're, that you, this, you didn't get elected because of your deep political Karl Rove-esque manoeuvres. You got elected because you, the wave pushed you over the edge, you yeah. know? And, and there's not, a lot of people the, saying, oh, this person is an amazing political strategist and this person, and it was because of this slogan and because of that. Yeah, okay, maybe 1% here and there, but ultimately, if there's a wave for you, it it, it, it lifts all ships. Yeah, there's a, the other factor here as well of why I think Sinn Féin are at risk of a bigger slump than than people are thinking is that all parties have a base of support. By base of support, I mean that in the 2011 general election, there were voters out there, and I'm not commenting on anyone present at all, but there were voters out there who, you know, if 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 Brian Cowan had come to their house, doused it in petrol, set it on a fire, and then walked away giving them both the finger, would have said, well, we were always Fianna Fáil and we're going to stick with them. There's still a chance. I mean, look, the fire brigade came quickly. That's thanks to the good work of Fianna Fáil. There's always, <laughs> there's, always, there's always that voter out there who will vote for you regardless. And with, with, with Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, that might be sort of 15 to 20% of the electorate each. People who just who regard politics as a sport and it's their team. And just like I would support Manchester United if they were in Division 3, which they may soon end up being if the current decline continues, there are people out there who will vote for their party regardless. The problem is with Sinn Féin, it is nothing like 15 to 20%. Before the last general election, when they got this huge surge of voters in, their base was sort of more like 10% max maybe 7 maybe 8%. And they've got a whole load of votes that are parked with them as sort of a generalised vehicle for discontent. And so if another vehicle for discontent comes along, those voters will have, have much less compunction about jumping ship to go elsewhere than sort of the, the diet in the wool Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gaelor will. And that's a big risk for them, especially when they're not connecting on an emotional level. That's what, that's, that's what I think. They may, they, may, they may be connecting on an emotional level more than I think they are, so, so I might be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong about the dynamic. Well, I mean, I think there was a feeling, you know, that you could pick up about Sinn Féin that's gone, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So people that I know who, like different, um, like I've said on the podcast before, like I grew up on Bath Avenue and I have lots of friends from Rings End and Irish Town. You could really feel like the growth of Sinn Féin, just in the conversations and stuff. And I think that's gone. Um, and I think it's worse than gone because I, I I feel, uh, uh, and I've spoken to people in the last couple of months, a real anger and disappointment amongst a lot of people in what Sinn Féin have or haven't done with regard to immigration and other, uh, other issues. So it's not that people are kind of like, you know, sliding away, they're jumping away. Mm. And if you're not... If you're if you have lost your identity as the party of protest, the party of anti-establishment, the party that you vote for if you want to kick the government in the face, well, who are you? Yep, there's there's as I say that, that's and and just like being overseas at the moment and looking at it from a distance, it just strikes me as a country where the political class, multiple elements of it, have this identity crisis. Um, the people who don't have an identity crisis. Um, and we want, I want to talk about them uh, because, in fairness, they had their party conference last weekend. Um, our friends in the Labour Party. So um, let us rise, comrade, and talk about them. Uh, I've been accused of being too mean to to, to Labour. So, um, y- y- you know, I, <laughs> I mean, come on. Come on. Well, what's going on here? First of all, I saw a video for Aon Reardon running for Dublin. For the love of Dublin, this is slogan. Well, for the love of God, make that campaign be overseen. I mean, 
this is the guy who protests against housing more. Is it more? I can't remember the numbers, but he is, has a long track record of protesting against housing in his own constituency. He's up there. He's up there. We won't we won't make any any potentially yeah. defamatory claims by saying he's yeah. the biggest objector to housing yeah. uh, in the doll. But he's up there. He's he's sort of he's definitely top ten. He's a competitor. Um, he's really he's really um, he's really interested in education because he's a teacher, but. Um, he was heavily involved in the Labour campaign to ban To Kill a Mockingbird from the school sy- syllabus because someone's feelings would be hurt by it. Um, spectacularly missing the point that To Kill a Mockingbird is a formative text in teaching people and educating people about racism and what can go wrong with racism, but by all means get rid of it because hurty words. Um, I think Aeon will not get elected to Europe, but I don't think um, that that's even necessarily his fault. I think I've said it before on the podcast. I'm trying to not be too mean because I was a bit mean about Ivana Bacic uh, and a lot of people found it really funny losing her seat a couple of weeks ago because I think her seat is genuinely in big trouble. I think uh, the photos of their conference were really interesting. If if I was a body language reader and I'm not, uh, Alan Kelly's body language at the side of the group photo was odd. I think they made a huge mistake getting rid of Alan Kelly. That's a that's a that's a hill I will die on forever. Um, and I think they they are at sea, floundering, um, representing nothing and no one, uh, talking absolute garbage about most things. And I think their party is in massive, massive, a massive risk of a real, really big wipeout. And however, I will say is, uh, and I've said before, and I like I and I don't want I I don't mean to not going to be kind of um you know whatever the word is about this there are some people in td that i know i know duncan smith i he, duncan smith is my local labor labor td here he's a very good local td he's a good speaker he's a bright guy um obviously i think he's wrong and everything he thinks but at the same time he is a good parliamentarian and i think it'll be a shame if he loses his seat but i think that they made this huge mistake with ivana Batrick. i think she's terrible uh, I think I listened to her interview on Sunday. I don't think anybody comes away from that voting for Labour that wasn't voting for Labour already. It's the same platitudes, the same nonsense. And it's just not good enough. I don't think they're at the races. And I think that Alan Kelly and his shouty Rory thing would at least show the public that this thing still had a pulse. And uh, Yeah, I, the difference is every time you see Alan Kelly on television, he was opposing the government. Yeah. You know, he was he was giving out about this disgrace or that disgrace or another disgrace or comp and and he is he's, yeah. he's I mean, anyone That's who watched true. anyone who watched the RTE committee hearings and watched the questions will know that Alan Kelly, whatever else he may be, is a top tier parliamentarian who can yes. put a witness in trouble and yeah. ask a really piercing question and get to the nub of an issue. There's intelligence there. And obviously there must be some intelligence somewhere in Ivana Batchett because she reached the academic heights she did. But every time I see her on television, she's supporting the government. Like she came on the mornings morning of the two referendums, um, and uh, she was one of the first politicians out the door, and she kind of did a half-hearted kind of like, oh, well, the government didn't campaign for it enough, and Labour supported it reluctantly. But you could tell she was basically there as a, a supporter of the government position, and she is on every issue. She's there as a supporter of the government position, and it just kind of like, it's the worst job in Ireland, hon. What are you doing it for? You know, yeah. find some issues, find some issues. Like you know, like. I would say that number three or four issue that we get emails in about all the time is about housing lists on the country and the, and discrimination in housing lists and kind of like a real proper, and I don't mean to sound elitist when I say this, but a real proper old school working class issue and Labour have nothing to say about it. Nothing. They're, they're out there all the time uh, talking absolute nonsense about... Um, oh, John, you forgot they're going to build a million, million homes, remember? Yeah, well, that's... That's something, I suppose, but but like you know, for who? Um, it, it's 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 just it just she she feels pointless. Yeah. And then and then as somebody said to me like like I didn't watch her speech, but I did hear the "Let us rise, comrades." I know. And then you sound <laughs> like it's more a, of that. It's more of that thing where I was like, "Oh God!" In between "Let us rise" and "You ain't seen nothing yet," I was like, "Oh my God." happening I, I mean uh, that might have been inspirational coming from I don't know James Connolly standing on the back of a trailer talking to the poor of Dublin in 1914 or 1915 or 1913 during the lockout but coming from a well-heeled barrister to an audience at the Labour Party conference which spoiler alert 
is 95% other well-heeled barristers yeah. saying, let us rise, comrades. Kind of feels like a Simpsons parody of the centre-left. Yeah. It does. It's it's like it's it's like woke stone cutters. Yeah. Um, and uh, I just at this stage, it would be a mercy if the public would put that political party out of its misery. Sit um, <laughs> down, terminally ill. I, I, and the voters, if you're listening, voters, you already did this service for the Progressive Democrats back in the day. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That wasn't necessarily the best idea. That's not, it may, quite, it, it may, not a quake of two things. It may not have been. It may not have been. You know, sometimes people put their dogs to sleep a little bit too early. Well, this one is on its last legs and suffering. And I think it's I think it's about time that it was taken to the vets. Um, that's all I, I'll say on that subject. Um, speaking of people being put to sleep, before we go, and if this I knew is you were going to, I knew you were going to do that segue, and I was like, "Ooh." Okay. Um, tell us the story because the other, th- the other political thing that happened during the week, moving all away from all this sort of nonsense about political figures making fools out of themselves and lacking an identity, there is still people working away in the background here to advance various legislation in the country that's that the people maybe aren't aware of enough. So let's talk about uh, what the Euthanasia Committee did last week. Um, and uh, and you you mentioned to me before we came on the show the story of a young woman in Canada who's 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 having her life ended because she's got what's his autism, isn't it? Yeah. Well, her father is. Um, so it's <clears throat> there's no names because it's you know obviously um, in family court, so it's private, but. The gist of the story is that the father and daughter live together. Um, she has requested uh, a, a, to be to die by euthanasia, um, but her father is arguing that she's autistic um, and that she shouldn't be eligible because um, of her autism and because of other mental health problems. And he's claiming that she's being influenced by a third party. And um, so he's looking for a, a judicial review of the case. Um, but her lawyers. Um, are saying that he shouldn't be allowed to interfere with her decision because it's been approved by doctors. And basically the case has come to um, real public attention because there's been a dramatic rise in euthanasia deaths in Canada um, since the procedures became legal in 2016. Um, this woman is 27 years of age and, um, you know, she she doesn't have um, any of the kind of... Um, there's nothing threatening her natural life. She's good if, if 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 no, and, she's and, perfectly capable of living to seventy or eighty years of age. Yeah, and at the moment, like it, it's just becoming much 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 more controversial in Canada because they're supposedly considering allowing sick kid children, um, and mentally ill people to um, opt for lethal injections, and I suppose it makes the point that ultimately, when we're looking at that for Ireland. And we've, you know, had this conversation before on other topics, but, the, you know, you're always kind of poo-pooed when you make the slippery slope argument and you'll be inundated with cases, hard cases about, you know, the 75-year-old man who has, you know, a, a motor neuron disease or something where that will render him absolutely incapable of making any decisions once the condition reaches a certain point. And they are extremely difficult cases. But the problem is that once, and we're, this is case in point here, introduced euthanasia in 2016, you know, now a number of years later, talking about a, a 27-year-old with autism, talking about children, talking about people with mental mental uh, health disorders, not, you know, somebody whose body is, you know, go- going to render them unable to speak very soon or who's in unbearable pain, but, you know, younger and younger and harder and harder and more complicated cases. And it's just a really sad troubling thing like for me like as a parent like this father is fighting the state to not kill his daughter like or allow his daughter to kill herself but I mean if we were sitting here with talking with progressive people about a, a father who was fighting the state that his daughter wouldn't be killed by lethal injection because she'd committed a crime everybody who was considered you know liberal would be up in arms about it so why yeah, is this any different well you hit the nail on the head because this is the, the slippery slope arguments have limitations yeah the problem is the slippery slope argument with with uh, euthanasia assisted dying assisted suicide whatever you want to call it has no limitations because it is ultimately a matter of fundamental self-determination right it's it's about it's about your right to decide on your own terms when your life ends and it begins with the hard case of 
somebody who is going to die in six months and is on, in unbearable pain, that all of us, including you and I, as we've said before in this show, sympathize with and, and probably instinctively, and certainly I'll, I'll admit it, instinctively in that case, I want to say, yeah, I do want to put you through six months of pain if you're going to die in the end anyway, go, go ahead. That is a human, rational instinct. But the problem is that most um, slippery slope arguments have what you'd call sort of a rational dividing line that you can you can probably draw. And I'll give you the example of another one that's that's very dear to a lot of people's hearts, which is abortion, where it's abortion is not ultimately, at least for the, the child's being aborted, it's not a matter of self-determination because that right has been taken away from the child. It is now the mother's right. But you draw a line there, or people argue you can draw a line, based on a stages of fetal development. So, you know, whether that be six weeks, there's a heartbeat, um, three months, the you know, 20 weeks, the child is viable, whatever. You, there are points where you can, you can, if you're a pro-choice person, conceivably draw a line and say, well, this is, this is where my morality stops here. I don't happen to agree with those lines, but you can draw them. Yeah, but when I mean, I, when it comes to the subject of abortion, 90, 99% of people, it's just a matter of where they draw the line and where I draw the line are different. Yeah. No, that's 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 true, and that's a that's a valid criticism. But nonetheless, people can draw lines that are based on something other than a human right. Yeah. Whereas in the case of assisted dying, once you concede the principle that ending your life is a fundamental matter of self determination, and your right as a sovereign person to choose the time, date, manner of your own death, then that's that's it. That's game over. Because there is no rational reason to to grant that self determination to one person and not to grant it to another. There's there's no rational reason to do it, um, and that is why in every jurisdiction that this has been introduced, the the it expands to the extent that what they're now talking about in Canada is. And, and I want to emphasize, Sarah and I are not talking about the Irish legislation that is proposed here, although it won't see the light of day before the election. But, you know, it, it, this debate is coming one way or the other in, in, in this year, next year, the following year. Um, we're not talking about the initial legislation. The initial legislation will be, as it is in every other country, restrictive. And that debate is a red herring because ultimately what, what we're putting into the law is saying people have the human right to decide when to end their own lives if they feel that they are suffering and their suffering is unbearable. And, and, and basically, your unbearable suffering and my unbearable suffering are subjective. You, know, you can tell me that your suffering is unbearable because I, I you know God forbid one of your kids doesn't get into into UCD yeah. and they've got to go to Dublin business school or something uh, you, the shame of it could be mortifying and I could say Sarah cut yourself off uh, as and I, I, obviously you wouldn't do that but I'm, I'm saying that as an example another yeah. person could say it is it is you know I, I've got depression another person could say it's you know I've got cancer if it's something you decide yourself that your suffering is unbearable, then there's no rational line for drawing for drawing a distinction. It, it's but, either a matter of your own choice or it's not. But also, but also, what happens is, and and, and you know, if you, like you used the point of, uh, a few minutes ago of somebody who's dying, right? And the the absolute certainty is that they're going to die within the next six months, and they're in unbearable pain. So death is the outcome of this condition. But in this situation. The courts are ag- agreeing that there is no there's there's no evidence that she has anything that's not fixable, right? So when you introduce something like euthanasia and you legalize it for things like this, it's sort of like you, 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 you if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you know what I mean, like so, you, 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 and, and I would suspect in this case somebody has autism that has now begun to fixate on this as the only option mm-hmm. with. To the to the cost of all other potential options. So if I go to a if I go to a therapist right tomorrow and I say I'm a forty year old woman and I'm extremely depressed and I have this and I have that and whatever. Well, the ther- this, the therapist will look at first of all like medication. Will look at you know w- w- what might be what situation I might be in. A, a, an abundance of solutions and probably multiple solutions to fix this problem. But if you're you're allowed to become fixated on this as the only route. It's to the it's at the expense of every other option. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? And so this 27 year old and and the father is 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 making the claim that she's being influenced by a third party. Like your child could just be you know and no more than you know indoctrinated into a certain way of thinking and thinking about a certain way is the only way. 
Now, more than any a, a lot of other hot topics that we discuss on this uh, podcast that, you know, falls in with bad actors, people who think they're being compassionate and ends up having life changing, disfiguring or life altering or indeed life ending um, outcome based on the relationship that they forge with this other per- third party. That's very, very troubling to me. This, the other thing is, is, of course, the power of suggestion, which you touched on. Yeah. Like, I always make the point that people people used to make the argument of euthanasia that old people would feel pressured to end their lives, to not be a burden. And mm-hmm. I always make the point, nobody ever, at least no normal person, ever goes to Granny, looks at her bank balance and her will, and says, Granny, you're an awful burden on me, because she might change the will, right? That's not what happens. Greed always presents itself under the guise of compassion. And so what that person does is they go to Granny and go, Granny, it's awful to see you suffering. Oh, it's awful. I don't know how you're going on. You're so brave. And it's just, it's nearly killing us watching this going on. And it's awful to see it happening to you. That's, that's, that's how it's presented. And it's the power of suggestion that people, people, people are told all of a sudden that their suffering is unbearable. You know, and there's no, there's no, you know, like it suddenly becomes brave in a way to admit that you can't bear what's happening to you, even if you can, or you feel you can. You kind of by there's a psychological. I, I during the abortion referendum, I remember talking about the psychological change that abortion inflicts on a on a population. Um, and I gave the example. Uh, in one of the final debates, and it didn't change people's minds, um, and I'm not saying it'll change people's minds now, but it it has always stuck with me, of the woman in the UK who went into a neonatal clinic with her child that had uh, Down syndrome and was sitting beside another mother and the mother peered in uh, across across, across her arms into where her child was in her arms and just asked three words, did you know? The implication being that had you known um, you wouldn't have had the child. That there's that the, the cultural expectation shifts towards if these bad things happen to you, there's a there's a solution that the state has provided, and that's what happens with euthanasia as well. Whether your suffering is unbearable or not, if you're suddenly if you're diagnosed with cancer and you've gotten six months left to live and it's throat cancer or something else that's really painful, the societal expectation becomes that your suffering must be unbearable. That you 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 must want a way out. Um, and that happens in in all sorts of cases. That's why it's it's such a dangerous law. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's it, it'll be fascinating. And, and obviously, this is is one as well. I have to say this: the committee introduced this piece of legislation. Basically, if you went back and watched the debates, and we covered them extensively on Grip, hardly anyone else covered the debates uh, that were in the committee. Sure. Were basically, against the against the recommendation of a majority uh, or close to a majority of the expert witnesses, they. They interviewed. I don't have the exact figures, so I'm not going to say absolutely that it was a majority, but I'm fairly sure it was um, because it was ideological. Because they they decided this is what they wanted to do, and this is the compassionate thing to do. Therefore, it should be done. Um, mm-hmm. So it's 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 one that's coming down the line. That is hard. Anyway, have we anything else to talk about before we let the good people go and enjoy their Easter? No, I think um, we'll be in an interesting next couple of weeks when Simon Harris comes in. We'll wait and see what Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil and everybody does. But um, I think with the local European elections coming up, everyone should have a good rest because I think uh, the uh, political shit is going to hit the fan in June. Yeah, well, it's now just 10 weeks to go. Um, and uh, you know, the candidate fields are far from settled. I mean, all the main parties have their candidates on the pitch. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some some late-breaking entrants who could shake the thing up a little bit. Um, and... You know, there's a there's a lot to a lot that's going to happen in the next ten weeks. It's going to be really, really interesting. So we'll keep talking about it here. If you guys keep listening, um, thanks as always for the fact that you do. We're thrilled with our listenership numbers. They are a, a shock, I think, to both Sarah and I, who don't understand why people exactly want to listen to us waffle on for an hour a week. They're an even we'll bigger shock to the people who hate that we exist, though. So that's really fun. Yeah, that is true. All right, listen, um, happy Easter, one and all. We will see you once again this day next week for another edition of The Week That Really Was. Until then, from Sarah and from myself, happy Easter and take care.